Hello, everybody, and welcome into another edition of Weekly with Wheatley. I'm your host, Brady Beaton, joined, as always, by the head ball coach, Tyrone Wheatley. Coach, thanks for spending another week with me. Glad to be back. So, I have to start with Saturday. You lose in the last minute to Concordia, I guess. Put it simply, what was the message after the game, uh, just talking to the team, and then what was the message? I know there were some frustrated fans, felt like they had a win, couldn't quite grab it. What was the message after that game? It's the same message, right? Details. Details, detail, details, right? So the game, we had it there, but the guys at the last minute faltered, made some critical errors, and uh, we just have to continue to do the details because we talked about the word frustrated with the team, you know, the fans, as well as some of the guys in, um, on the team, they say frustrated, right? They kept mm-hmm. using the word frustrated. Well, frustrated has is you know one of the main terms, and frustrated is inability to change, mm-hmm. right? So, if you have eighty five percent of the team that was there from last year, and they continue to do some of the things and don't want to change, you're going to be frustrated, mm-hmm. right? You're going to be annoyed. You're going to be frustrated, but you have to change. And so, yes, the fans thought that we were going to come away from a win. We should have won, but at the same time, these guys are growing through a culture. And they're going through a coaching change, and, and, and they're getting there. I do see some positives in these young men. What happened in the game? Because at one point in the game, felt like your offensive line was dominating. Your offensive line was changing the line of scrimmage by two, three yards. And then in the second half, whatever was working wasn't there. What changed from what you were having when you were having success, primarily in the first half, to when the offense wasn't moving the ball in, in quarters three and four? Competitive stamina. Hmm. Right? Right. Um, I know people are going to say, well, he says the same thing. Well, that's what happens. You have to continuously beat these into these guys' heads and, and stay consistent, right? Consistent. That's the whole word. So when you say what was working in the first half didn't work in the second half. Well, it did. It was there. But if mm. you watch the film, it was just one guy here, one guy there. And you just have to be consistent, right? And that's what we talked about, the competitive stamina. Being able to do the same thing over and over and over at that same intensity and that same level. And that's how good teams win. Seemed like your defense was the opposite. Maybe struggled in the first half a little bit, then really gave your offense multiple chances in that second half to to either put it away or get get the lead in general. What'd you see from your defense? Take the positives out of the first half, but the corrections to be made in half number two as well. Well, as we talked about before, right? If your defense is on the field a long time, the the the, the opponent offense gets a chance to cycle through their playbook. Our offense put together drives that kept our defense off the field, and they were fresh. And when they're fresh, they look really good. Mm. When you talk about the opportunities that they gave us, you know, gave the offense a chance to go put it away, uh, once again, we just go back to now the offense just, you know, made key errors and and, and momentum momentum killing moments, right? But the defense at the same time had two critical uh, penalties that kind of put us Mm. behind the chains. It feels like at least with defense, you can play pretty well for 90% of the game. But, hey, you make one mistake, you, you, you make a misread on a coverage, and you get beat over the top, and that's what everyone remembers. How important is it for the defense is your margin of error is razor thin because you make nine good plays, but you mess up on the tenth one, and guess what? It goes for six, and next thing you know, the other team's celebrating on their sideline. Well, that goes for offense as well, mm. right? You could play nine great plays, but on that third and one, you don't convert. You give the ball back to the defense, right? Mm-hmm. Then it puts the defense in a bad situation to where they don't have – they play nine good plays, and then on that tenth one, mm. something bad happens. So it's complimentary football. Uh, I think our special teams played pretty well, which didn't – you know, our drive started, I think, on average of 35-yard line, which mm-hmm. we weren't starting on our 15 or our 10. So that was great for us. The punter flipped the field for us a couple of times where, you know, the defense wasn't playing in the red zone. So – but just going back to just complimentary football, that's all it is. How did the kids bounce back because, you know, as a player, you're on the wrong end of a frustrating loss, and sometimes it wears on you, especially when you you haven't had the game go your way the last few weeks. How was the locker room Sunday, and how have they bounced back to practice now as you've gotten into game week for Tech? Well, once again, you just have to look at the word frustrated, right? Mm -hmm. Like I keep talking about the definition of it. You have to change. And so sometimes in change, you have to look within yourself and figure out what did I have to contribute to that loss? Where Mm -hmm. was it? Right? It's not saying that you're blaming anybody. It's just being accountable. You have to look within yourself. What did I do to contribute to that loss? How can we change it? And so it doesn't happen again. And then the players within the locker room have to pull pull together and say, hey, listen, 
we know this has happened to us on multiple occasions. So these are the things that we have to change for it to, to prevent it. And so when, they, when you put it to them that way, it's right. It's anything how you present to them, right? Mm -hmm. And they, they're, they're upbeat. You know, they're upbeat. They're ready to go. As a coach, how do you try to push that change? How do you try to get it through their heads maybe a little quicker and try to expedite the process? Because, you know, you're going to have some tough football games coming up. And if you don't, if you make some of the same mistakes, hey, there's some pretty good teams in the GLIAC. There's some teams that um, don't make mistakes that can take advantage of it. As a coaching staff, how do you try to get the kids where they need to be entering conference play? It's just like being a parent. Mm -hmm. Consistency, right? Just consistency with your messaging, with what you want and how you want it done. And it has to be consistent because the moment you give a little, mm -hmm. as they say, you give them an inch, they take them out, yep. right? And so you have to be consistent in your messaging and what you want and how you want it. And then at some point in time, it, it breaks. It, they click, right? It clicks for mm -hmm. them. That, that proverbial light bulb goes bling. Ah, I got it. And then all of a sudden, they start to become what you want them to become. Have you seen progress from, hey, what you were preaching at the start of camp, maybe week one against Slippery Rock, now over a month into the season? Are you seeing them start to, the gears start to turn a little bit? They don't have it all the way yet, but do you at least see a little bit of progress towards them starting to have that aha moment? Yeah, like I said, one thing is they play hard. These guys play hard. They fly around. The second thing that I'm really proud of them is, is body language, right? Mm -hmm. Their body language is starting to change. The one thing that we still have to grow in is just attention to detail. It's, mm -hmm. it's them understanding that it's football. It's football season. Mm -hmm. Nothing else matters. The circumstances outside of football is not more important than the circumstances in football. So, Yes, you have girlfriends. Yes, you have parents. You have all these things. But at some point in time, you have to tell them, hey, I won't see you until December. Right. And, uh, yeah, that's always – that's got to be your, your, your happy place. That's got to be where you go to, to let everything shut it out. I always like to bring up some of the positives. Who were some of the guys when you turned on film you thought, hey, you played a pretty good game because it's never as good, it's never as bad as you think. And even in wins, you have guys that play bad. In losses, you had guys that played well. Who do you think played well for you on Saturday night? Offensively, I would say a guy who shows up on our stat sheets, but not just in our stat sheet. I, I would just say in, invisible stats where you can't see, but he's mm -hmm. doing a great job, Tavion Warren. Mm -hmm. I mean, he plays an incredible game in and out. He's, he's, he's one of those selfless guys that where he's running a route, mm -hmm. he runs it for his buddy to, to get open. So, like I say, those are things you don't see. And when you talk about growth, that's where, we're, that's where the growth is. He, he's, he's playing football right now at a level where um, he's, he's, he's selflessness and he's wanting his teammates to do well. So he's playing really well. Defensively, I want to give it to our defensive line. Our defensive line played in a pretty good, you know, pretty good game. Up until that point, you know, game on with the uh, penalty – you know, with the bat, he, you know, he was playing pretty well. Uh, but, you know, we have uh, several guys. Yeah, I thought game on obviously wasn't the final play he wanted. But up until that point, that's why I kind of was alluding to earlier is for 58 minutes, he was playing a pretty darn good football game. But that's how, I guess, delicate football can be. And the, the difference between winning and losing. So everyone getting ready, staying healthy. But you, the defensive line as well, they were banged up a little bit. And I thought those guys played pretty well. Yeah, like I said, we're talking about another growth spurt in these guys. They're learning to how to prepare themselves, take care of themselves, maintain themselves, but at the same time, no one is 100% once the season starts. Right. But you have to learn how to charge your body to get back to 80% or perform. I call it performing, performing battery level, right, mm -hmm. your performance battery level. What is that? For some guys it's 70, some guys it's 80, but whatever it is, you know, those nicks and those bruises, man, you got to play through those because everyone is hurt. And I'll tell you what, I know Michigan Tech doesn't care if you're feeling bad. I know the rest of the GLIAC doesn't care if you're feeling bad. And likewise, hey, if they come down banged up, you're not going to feel sorry for them. That's just the way football is. And I know when we come back, you're going to be talking about a pretty physical football team and a pretty well-coached team at that. Absolutely. All right, Coach, we'll let you step aside for a moment. Enjoy lovely Woodbridge Pub. But that's Coach Tyrone Wheatley. We'll bring on... Tight ends coach Pat Fogarty Jr. in a moment. You're listening to Weekly with Wheatley. I'm Brady Beaton live from Woodbridge Pub. Welcome back to Weekly with Wheatley live from Woodbridge Pub. I'm Brady Beaton now joined by Wayne State tight end coach Pat Fogarty. Coach, thanks so much for uh, taking some time to talk with us this week. I appreciate you guys having me on. Uh, excited to be here. All right, Pat, let's talk about your background a little bit before we get to how you ended up in Detroit. 
like a lot of the guys on offense, not from around here, from yeah. down south, played college ball at Stetson. What was that like? You know, played a pretty high-level college ball, and I know you come from a pretty well-regarded uh, family of athletes. Yeah, so uh, born and raised Savannah, Georgia. Um, you know, I uh, played high school at Benedictine Military School. Uh, after that, I, uh, you know, like you said, went to college at Stetson. Uh, it was a brand-new program when I started, so uh, head coach was Coach Roger Hughes, uh, great coach. Uh, so I was there for five years because we all read sure that first year. Um, and then after that, I had the opportunity to uh, coach high school for three more years uh, under Coach Danny Britt. So I did that for three years, coached an offensive line. Um, then I went back to Stetson as kind of like my foot in the door of college football mm -hmm. uh, as like kind of a QC. So did that, working with the offense. And then uh, had an opportunity to uh, GA at Bowling Green. So I did that for two years, working with the offensive line. And uh, now I'm here. And, uh, you know, playing at Stetson was uh, – it was a great opportunity. Like I said, it was first year program, so we definitely kind of took our bumps early on. But you know, made some great, met some great uh, friends, some great teammates that were, and I'm still close with today. So you've seen just about every level of organized football. I mean, you've been at the the FBS level when you're at Bowling Green. You coach high school. What have you noticed? What's one thing that hey, what's consistent between all the levels? And the one thing you notice, like, all right, these are what the big time programs do compared to what maybe some high school lower end programs do. That's a good question. You know, at the end of the at the end of the day, uh, you know, football is football, and, and you know, every and every level is, uh, you know, it's yeah, you know, FBS is a lot different than high school, but at the end of the day, you know. The game's still relative, mm -hmm. so I mean, you know, the scheme's still the same. You know, uh, you know, just uh, the level of play might be a little bit better at some levels, but uh, you know, I think uh, in terms of coaching, um, you know, just it's uh, yeah, it's a tough question, but yeah. I mean, it's it's uh, you know, it's very similar. I think uh, uh, that's a tough question. Uh, yeah, I don't know. So, all right, let's talk about just. The places you've been, because again, mostly in the South. Did you ever envision yourself spending any time in Bowling Green, Ohio, or coming up to Michigan? When you started in coaching, were you hoping to stay in the South, or were you just going to take you wherever the road led you? Great question. So, you know, I had no idea I would be in Detroit, Michigan today. Mm -hmm. So I, had, you know, I didn't think I'd be at Bowling Green. Um, you know, I, when I was was coaching high school I kind of thought I would just kind of stay in high school and then I had the opportunity to coach in college I knew I wanted to coach in college but uh that's the crazy thing about coaching is just that you have no absolutely no idea where you're going to land so uh but I like it here in Detroit I mean I, it's uh, I have a great time here uh I enjoy coaching with coach Wheatley and the rest of the staff and I know this is a very proud town you know people take a lot of pride in uh in their football but in their town and uh no I, I enjoy living here in Detroit when did you first hear of Wayne State? When was it first on your radar? Because I can tell you, at least in the state, the biggest thing that I hear is some pe a lot of people will write off, oh, it's in Detroit, whatever. And then they come and they actually see it and they go, oh, this is actually really nice. This isn't what I expected. W did you know anything about Wayne State before you started coming up here? And what were your first impressions when you got here? So it's funny you asked. So I remember when I was in high school, I, uh, you know, I watched all the college football games mm -hmm. on TV and whatnot, but I remember watching uh, the uh, – I forgot what year it was, but it was the Wayne – the yeah. National Championship 2011, game, yeah. 2011, so they were playing Pitt State. Mm -hmm. and I guess it was like late December or whatever, but I remember I was just watching TV, and I remember watching Wayne State, Pitt State. I remember watching that game. So I've heard of Wayne State before, mm -hmm. and uh, I just – so it's funny you ask that. Real quick, in that 2011 game, man who ran back the opening kickoff, Josh Rennell will be in the booth. I had to give him a quick shout-out, Wayne State Hall of Famer. It is Hall of Fame weekend for homecoming, so they will honor the new Hall of Fame class. But again, let's talk about now being a tight ends coach because maybe more than any other position group, outside of maybe quarterbacks, you have a small group. Yeah. You don't have to deal with 17 linemen or or a dozen DBs you get your maybe half a dozen guys and you get to coach them up what's it been like being the tight ends coach with, a, with such a small group yeah so uh you know I'm very lucky I got a great group of guys I coach you know there's only there's seven of them uh and the thing with the tight end position there's so there's so much stuff you gotta you know, know how to do mm. with, especially in this offense you know uh you gotta be a really good blocker you know both on the on the line and off the line uh you gotta be a great blocker out in space on the perimeter and then you, you got to know where to line up, and then you got to, uh, 
you know, you got to run routes. So mm-hmm. it's, you know, it's a very unique position. Um, you know, in terms of the blocking, you know, I have an offensive line background, so I think I can help him with the run blocking. But uh, and it's been great for me, too, as, as a coach, to learn, like, you know, more about the tight end position. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky. I got a great group of guys. You know, every, every practice they come out and they work hard. And, uh, you know, I'm going to just c- continue to coach them hard and get them right. Did, what connection did you have with this coaching staff? I mean, did you, did you know Coach Demasi? I know you're both down from Georgia. And what was it like, the process, to knowing that someone maybe you knew was up here or deciding, hey, I want to be coaching uh, here in Midtown? So, uh, you know, with Coach Wheatley, uh, obviously he's a great coach. Uh, mm. When I was at Bowling Green, you know, there's a lot of guys on that staff that were kind of the same era of Michigan – at Michigan when he was there. So there was a connection there. Uh, with Coach Demasi, you know, growing up in Savannah, we always knew of each other. You mm-hmm. know, he's a little bit older than I am, but, you know, his dad, you know, covers all the high school sports in Savannah. He does a great job. So uh, I always knew of the, you know, Coach Demasi. And, uh, and he actually coached my brother at Savannah State for a year before he left. But uh, so there's that connection. But uh, and then just, you know, knowing about it when I was at Bowling Green, obviously it's, you know, only an hour, you know, Bowling Green's an hour south, so I knew about Detroit, mm-hmm. knew about Wayne State. But, uh, you know, I'm very lucky to have this opportunity here, and I'm excited to be here and uh, to continue to, uh, you know, build, help build this program. Let's talk about some of the guys in your room. One of them found the end zone on Saturday, and you're seeing a lot of use uh, again in this offense. Sometimes you'll, you'll get a, a couple extra tight ends in there. Sometimes it's really spread out. But talk about the guys you have in that tight end room. Yeah, so, uh, you, know, uh, you know, John Rava is someone who I think's done a great job stepping up. Uh, you know, he's a natural leader, and, uh, you know, he's, he's done a great job. He kind of does, you know, does whatever he's coached to do, and, it's gonna, and he's a hard worker. Um, you know, uh, KB on Ross is a credible athlete. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, he you know, makes a lot of plays, but we're going to continue to, you know, coach him, coach, coach him up and get him right on his technique. Um, you know, Rod, someone who kind of suffered an injury. Uh, early on, but you know he's done a good job getting to where he needs to get, getting to where he needs to be. Mm. Um, uh, uh, Nick Ghostis, you know he was a lineman uh, converted to a tight end, and in the spring, you know he was a bigger body, and uh, you know probably need to lo- lose a little bit of weight. Right. And he's done that. You know he's done that. And he's continued to work hard, and he's a, you know he's great in the run game. Uh, you know Tommy Guajardo, you know he was at. And Green when I was there, mm-hmm. so we had uh, known each other before. Um, you know, incredibly strong kid. Uh, you know, he's a great kid, works hard. Uh, you know, Joe Ben Scooter, freshman, mm-hmm. has done a good job, and he's, you know, I'm really looking forward to continue to watch him and co- continue to coach him. And then uh, Gabe Mendoza, somebody, you know, you know, will do whatever you tell him to do, incredibly, incredibly hard worker, mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, I really enjoy coaching Gabe. Have a lot of youth in that group, and, and maybe the guys that have been around haven't been around as a tight end. Yeah. So as a coach, it might some coaches might love it. Some coaches might see it as a downside. But you were basically starting with a blank slate with all these kids. What's it been like adapting it to this offense? I think we talked last week with Coach Wheatley. This can be a very delicate offense to where when everyone's doing their job, it's looking it looks beautiful. But, hey, one guy's a half second slow or the exchange something – then that's when you get that negative play. But how has it been working with these guys that have basically didn't have any prior knowledge at the tight end position or at least college snaps? Yeah, great question. So, uh, you know, going into spring, learn a completely new offense, you know, you're, you're going to have your hiccups. So, mm-hmm. obviously, we had our hiccups early on, um, whether it be, you know, technical, um, you know, just completely, you know, a, a missed assignment. So, in the spring, we know we went through our hiccups, but we've continued to work hard and get better at them. And, you know, techniques – never going to be perfect but that's something you want to strive to you know be perfect so you know uh, I think they've done a good job learning the offense and continuing to learn the offense and expand on the offense so I'm you know I'm excited to, uh, you know to keep coaching these guys and see what, what what can happen all right coach just one more question for you what's been one of your favorite parts about living in in the metro Detroit area something that you maybe you didn't know or you did know that you're really enjoying up here so the uh it's kind of a funny story, but I always thought the, the weirdest thing, so, you know, living in Ohio for, you know, I guess two seasons, mm. you know, I really didn't know much of this until I moved here in Detroit, but I remember, like, you know, you start meeting people, and you're like, oh, hey, where are you from? Mm. And they'll, they'll, you know, they'll show your hand or whatever. Yeah. And so then I kept, uh, you know, kept, uh, you know, I would ask players, like, hey, where are you from? They show me their hand, and then uh, finally I was in the tight end room. I was right. like, 
why are you guys always show me like your hand and point? They're like, well, it's the state of Michigan, coach. So that's kind of a funny thing. But you know, I think the the people of Detroit are very proud people, and they mm. take a lot of they have a lot of pride in their city. Uh, you know, it's a tough city. Um, people take a lot of pride. People work hard, and you know, I really enjoy living here and uh, and and being here at Wayne State. Well, coach, I appreciate it. And I, I really enjoyed having you on. Uh, thanks again, and well, good luck Saturday at homecoming. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Tight end coach Pat Fogarty will have, yeah, let's give him a round of applause, and we'll have Tyrone Wheatley back on here with Weekly with Wheatley live from Woodbridge Pub here in a moment. Welcome back to Weekly with Wheatley. It's our final segment with head coach Tyrone Wheatley, and let's talk about homecoming. Michigan Tech's taking the long trip down from Houghton to play this game. If there's one thing I could tell you about Tech, not going to make mistakes. And they're going to play pretty darn physical. Sounds like a lot of the teams we've talked about already this year. <laughs> well, I think that's the um, consensus of the old GLIAC, right? Uh, and and that, that's what you take. Really, just think about football in any sport. That's, that's what it takes to win, right? And, um, but we have to be on our P's and Q's with this team, right? They're, they're sneaky. They do some things. They will try and lull you to sleep, mm-hmm. but they will try to throw trick play in there once in a while. They'll, they do a lot of motions on offense to try and get your eyes to look other places and then to hit you in certain spots. But this is a really good team. I know they're still going to be physical, but they've had a coaching change as well, and they're not going to line up and just try to run it at you and basically bully you and say we're going to be tougher for 60 minutes. And they'll throw it around a little bit now. They'll, they'll try to maybe dink and dunk, and you know they can throw it 30 times a game, where in years past I think they would have liked to have run it 70%, 80% of the time. What do you see with this Michigan Tech offense? Well, that's kind of what I was alluding to, right? So they, they will run it, but in the passing game, they will motion, shift to try and get you, like I said, get the defense off balance, get them to rotate, to kind of create favorable leverage in terms of the passing game where they can throw the ball. But then at the same time, they get you rotating, and they'll see where your weakness is, and then they'll run back the other way. They do a great job of that. So like you say, they won't line up and try and come at you so far, but they'll try and create the weaknesses through the motions and through the shifting and try and formate you in that way. Talk about Tech's defense. I know when I was uh, over there uh, the other day, the talk was they got a pretty good D line. They got a pretty good DN that is a disruptor, that is a disturber, that makes a difference. What do you see with this Husky defense? Well, they run fit. They run fit really well. And, yes, he does make a part. But the, uh, they also have a like Mike linebacker that's pretty darn good as, as well. So, you know, with those two and the combinations of it, they're going to give you cover three and cover four, which they keep everything in front of you. They're going to give you zone but they want to keep everything in front of you and let those front seven get after you and be disruptive, and they tackle everything. And like I say, it's a very trained, very well-oiled machine, and they do exactly what they're told, and they play that thing really well. The defense is a little odd. It's almost like, especially up front, like an amoeba defense where they're not going to be <laughs> set up one way. The whole You're laughing, but it's kind of true. They just kind of float around, at, but they always end up where they're supposed to be. And it's just... Uh, especially with an offense like you guys have, that that could pose a problem. Talk about that front and how you'll see the D linemen just kind of float around. They might line up a little funky, but at the when the ball snapped, more times than not, they're in the gap they're supposed to be in. Well, that's what I'm saying. They're, they're, they're gap sound. They're right. gap sound. So it makes no difference where they line up. And like you say, you call it amoeba, we call it radar, whatever <laughs> you want to call it. But at the end of the day, they have to end up someplace. Mm-hmm. And so when you take your keys and you take your run, right, so no matter if, if he's in, he might start in the A gap. He might line up as a, uh, a shade, but he's in the A gap, but he's going to the B gap. If I just take my steps and I'm going through the B gap, mm-hmm. and I know if it's a three technique I'm supposed to block, but he's not there, you have to assume it's coming and block it, right? And those are the things where we have to be on point and our guys and not just saying, hey, listen, we can't say they won't be there, but they will be there. Just take your steps, trust it, and block it. It is homecoming here at Wayne State this Saturday, honoring, as I mentioned earlier, the Hall of Fame members this year. Now, it's, it's great. It's always great to see a ton of alumni. I'm sure the, the Mathai parking lot will be packed. But I know some coaches, oh, homecoming, it's like, yeah, it feels like a distraction sometimes. What's it like preparing for homecoming here at Wayne State? Well, for one, you, you invite the homecoming, right. right? You invite it. Although you may not be having a season you want, but you invite it. You want the alumni to come back because it's, it's a huge part of our program, mm-hmm. right? So when they come, and, and instead of looking at things, you know, in a negative way, saying it's not the season we ha- want to have, but instead of coming back and saying, these young men need to see you here. They mm-hmm. want to see all the people. But at the same time, now you get into the donation aspect of it, the, right. the support. 
And that's all it is, right? You need to support and not just fill the stands homecoming, but fill the stands, you know, every weekend. I think that's one thing that I'm sure you found out pretty quickly is the alumni base here is pretty passionate, that you will see some of those same guys, whether they're from the class of 1975, 2015, or somewhere in between, that a lot of the guys come back, and I think homecoming's the biggest example of that. Oh, yeah. You, I mean, you love to see the tradition, right, that comes back, the, the various classes. You love to see them come back, but it goes back to what I was saying. These young men need to see them. Right? They need to see that there's support. They need to see that no matter what happens, they have a family, they have a fan base of people that care for them and really, really, as, they, as the kids say, ride with them, right? Mm -hmm. They want people to ride with them. And, but it, it's, it's really hard, you know, if you haven't had that in years past because they, they kind of feel like they're playing for nothing, mm -hmm. right? And so when those hard games come down, you need that 12th man. You need that 12th person in the stands to get to rally behind them. Uh, whether you, you know, noticed it or not, I mean, that was pretty big with Concordia. I mean, as small as their stands were, I mean, how can you have a few hundred people out cheer, you know, our side? Mm. You know, so, but that all kind of goes into it. And I, and I know a lot of people can say, hey, man, give us something to cheer about. But if you're an alumnus, it's unconditional love. Mm. You have to be for it, be here for us, and it has to start somewhere, right? So, got to be like a phoenix, man. We're going to rise from, you know, rise out of those ashes. So Michigan Tech takes a long trip down here. I'm just going to ask you, have you ever, I know you don't have to go up there now, have you ever been to Houghton before and, and way up in the UP? Uh, no, never heard of Houghton, no. <laughs> so I guess in a few weeks when you got to go up to Marquette, that's going to be some new territory as well? I, I, I've been to Marquette. I've okay. never heard of Houghton, but yes, I'm not really looking for that ride, but, you know, it's going to be one. Well, I know Tech's used to making that trip, and I can tell you it's uh, – it's about solid nine hours on the bus, and then that's without stops. That's without, you know, stopping for lunch. But they're going to be used to making it. I just didn't know if, you, if you've ever been up to Houghton because it is beautiful up there. It's just on the edge of the world. No, I've never been up there. So <laughs> never really had a reason to go. Well, you'll have a reason to go, like I mentioned, in a few weeks. But, you know, I think, I think this should be a fun one. And when you're on a losing streak like this, it's, it seems simple, and it doesn't seem like great analysis, but it feels like you just have to get a win. It doesn't matter, <clears throat> excuse me, if you go out there and you win by one point, you go out there, you win by 80 points. You get a win, and those kids start to, you know, believe and raise their competitive stamina, and next thing you know, you get a little momentum going into another home game and then the road trips. Winning is not easy. Even if you're on a winning streak, winning by one, <laughs> right. you know. But to, to answer the question... When you're on a losing streak, it, you have to basically continue to prove the point of you're getting better, but at the same time pointing out the, the things that they're doing to make, like I said, be holding each other accountable mm. for the losses. What are we doing to attribute these losses and to correct them? And so people say, yeah, that's easy, but it's easier. You know, I mean, it's harder said than done, right? It's not right. a very easy task, especially when you have young guys where they're, they're going, and all of a sudden the bad – situation happened, they say, oh, here we go again. That's a, that's a hard thing to break. I mean, these are habits, right? Mm. These are habits you're trying to break, and, and you have to get it out of them. As a coach, is it tough um, when you're trying to get back on the right track, figuring out, all right, do I want to tamper a lot? Do I, okay, do we need to change up all or just stay the course, stay the course, and it will come. It'll just take some time. Or find out, all right, maybe I have to push these buttons instead of these ones. No. Because it's, the team is already delicate, right? Mm. And, and right now, everybody's looking for change. They're, they're looking at the coach to see where you are, what are you doing, how are you handling this. And as soon as you change one little thing, it throws them off. Okay. And that's what I'm saying. You have, we as a coaching staff, we have to stay consistent in our message. You don't change. Mm -hmm. You don't change because as soon as you change, they notice it. And then all of a sudden, it throws them off. Because guess what? They're working their hearts out for you. And, if, and if, you, if you change, they don't know how to shift with that, right? So, but if you're consistent and they know they're going to get the same person day in and day out, win, lose, or draw, then they can stay on their path and it helps their growth and their development way faster than coming in and saying, okay, well, this week we're going to do this. Next week we're going to change this. Mm -hmm. That doesn't work at all. And I think we'll go back a few weeks to something you said that I think where you want this program to end up being is you want the leaders in that locker room to – Take on your message. Know that, hey, when they come in day in and day out, this is how you work at practice. This is how you lift in the weight room. Doesn't matter if we've won three straight or lost three straight. This is how you get it done. 
and then it almost is the, the trickle-down effect to, to the lower levels. So you can correct me if I'm wrong, but that seems like really the message you're trying to get across is you got to get some of the, the leaders in that locker room to, to follow the lead, and then it'll just slowly fall into place underneath them. Absolutely, because you also have to understand, yes, I am coaching this year. No, I'm not looking for next year, but you have to look at the bigger picture mm -hmm. because when you recruit a class next year, guess who's going to have to implement those rules and those changes in that locker room? Right. The players. So they have to buy into it. They have to trust it. So when the new crew comes in, they have to now implement it and teach it and live and abide by it when the new guys come in. And then the next year, and then the next year. So, um, you know, that school up north in uh, Ann Arbor with the wing helmets, it was preached to us. I never really heard the coaches talk. Mm -hmm. The coaches never said a word to us. It was the players. I remember as a freshman coming in, we had freshman locker room, and um, I remember walking out to freshman locker room, Buster Stanley, uh, Flakes, with uh, Corn Brown was called him Flakes. They told the freshmen to, you know, come in the locker room, come in their locker room. We was like, oh, Lord, what's this about? And they said, no, because we couldn't go in a fresh, we couldn't go in a right. varsity locker room, else they'll jump us. Back then, hazing was allowed. So, But we went in the varsity locker room, and they told us to look around. And then we, they, they showed us a row of where fifth-year seniors were. Mm -hmm. And they said, you're not going to mess this up for these fifth-year seniors. They've won four Big Ten titles in a row, and they're going for their fifth. You guys would not mess this up for them. Gary Moeller never said a word to us. Lloyd Carr, none of the coaches ever really spoke to us in that manner. It was the guys in the locker room. Mm. Everything was taken care of in the locker room. And because once the players buy in and the players understand how important it is, and I'm playing for you, mm -hmm. and you're playing for me, and not for yourself, and that's why the whole thing, you know, the bullshit back of the team, the team, the team. Right. When you can understand where my mess-ups and, and the things I'm not doing, like I'm not going to class, I'm not lifting weights, I'm not doing all the things in my playbook that I'm supposed to do, it doesn't hurt just me it hurts you right and so that was kind of the message that was sent to us as freshmen when we walked in how dare you do anything to mess this up for those fifth year seniors and that that echo but just the different sentiments from when i went from to the pros from from team to team all the great teams i ever played on was player led it was player led and so that's where these guys have to get to i guess with with a bigger picture question like that when you went when, when you were playing in the 90s you knew when you got someone, you, were, you had them for four or five years. Now a guy might come in and they might not have a red shirt year to learn the, the culture, learn what's expected of them. How do you implement that a little quicker? Because, you know, it's not, it's not the same as it was where you had basically two years to marinate a player before and, and indoctrinate them to how this program is going to be run. How do you do that and, and make that a little quicker? Because you might have a guy coming in that's a, a, a four-year player somewhere else at one point and already has their own idea of how it should be run. Well, he may have four years of experience someplace <laughs> else, but damn it, when he comes into my locker room, he's <laughs> going to adapt to it, right? And so that's what I'm saying. That's how you get the program started. And when you have a strong nest of guys that believe in what's going on, no matter where you come from, no matter how many years you've been there, you will adapt or you will, you know, <laughs> become extinct. All right, Coach, final question. I leave you with this every week. What are the keys to a Warrior victory against Michigan Tech on homecoming? Simple. Play hard football, no mistakes. Coach, I appreciate it as, as always. Good luck against Tech on homecoming. I appreciate it. Thank you. He's head coach Tyrone Wheatley. I'm Brady Beaton. You've been listening to Weekly with Wheatley live from Woodbridge Pub.